Oh, oh, high and deep out to right field. Judge back and watching, and it's gone. Started then right away. Yes. Yes. History made once again. It's official. Bubba Wallace gets his first career win. He's just the second African American to ever win at the highest level of NASCAR. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of Sports Speak. Hope you're doing well. I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. Lots to get to on this episode. MLB postseason is underway. We're going to be joined by Haley Galindo momentarily. Uh, to discuss that then, of course, a chaotic weekend in NASCAR at Talladega. Three first-time winners in three days. We'll be joined by Drew Jua to discuss the action and preview the cutoff race for the Cup Series this Sunday at the Charlotte Roval. First off, just one quick thing I want to once again mention, our NFL Weekly Pick'em. You can follow it on Twitter. Both of us are struggling a bit this year. It's been very unpredictable through the first four weeks, uh, but... You can follow along and see how we battle it out. Tim's had a little bit of the edge so far this year. We'll see how week five fares, but you can follow that on our Twitter at Sportspeak Live. But let's move on now to be joined by Haley Galindo to talk some MLB postseason action. All right, we're continuing here on Sportspeak. Eddie Kalegi, Tim Moore. We're joined now by Haley Galindo. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So, of course, a lot has gone down in the MLB postseason. And the first series I want to get into, of course, not really a series, but a wild card game between the Yankees and the Red Sox, which I know Tim is very frustrated about. We'll get his perspective in a moment. But the Red Sox at Fenway defended home field well. It's crazy to see the Yankees and the Red Sox fans, of course, were throwing shade at each other all season long just to finish with the exact same record. And then come down to a one-game playoff where Garrett Cole and the Yankees offense collectively did not show up and the Red Sox, despite being without J.D. Martinez, looked really good and were able to salvage things. Boston, I guess all they needed was Alex Cora because last year when they didn't have him as manager, they were terrible. And then this year they get him back, and all of a sudden they're playing well with basically the same roster. But, Haley, I'll go to you first. Tough loss for the Yankees. Big one for the Red Sox, though. Eddie, it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. This is coming from a Yankee fan. I mean, you never want to see your team go out, but especially that way. I mean – We'll talk about Cole because it's like the big elephant in the room right now. Mm. I mean, of course, you're going to start your A starter, you know, but if my whole it was just so frustrating because he didn't have it. Anyone can see that anyone can see this man did not have it that game. But it's like, why keep him there? That's what was even more frustrating. It was like it was like, Aaron Boone, what are you doing? Like, why is this guy still in there? I mean, so frustrating. I, I, I turned it off. I didn't even watch it. I didn't want to watch it. I knew we were going to lose. It's just a horrible game, a horrible game. That was so embarrassing for, for me. I mean, I'm a Yankee fan. I can tell you right now, that was so embarrassing. I know Tim's going to go go in on the Yankees right now. Yeah, Tim, go ahead. I know I know you've been rearing up. You texted me. You said you were ready to talk about the Yankees. Let's hear it. You know, I don't really know what to think about this team. And I'm not going to judge based upon, of course, one wild card game that I'm going to be openly honest. I fell asleep in the middle of the first inning because I knew before the end I texted Eddie this, the Yankees are going to lose, and they were going to lose bad. And I'm just going to put it like this. Haley hey, just brought a very good point about Aaron Boone, which – has been my biggest frustration now for four seasons. Mm -hmm. He can never understand baseball one-on-one simplistics and have an understanding when his pitchers are falling apart. In 2018, it was his fault that the Yankees fell apart in the postseason. In 2019, Yankees fans blamed Giancarlo Stanton for his improductivity along with Edwin Car uh, Encarnacion. In 2020, oh, the Yankees just were one play and just simply weren't good enough. But we were set to believe that in 2021, a team that only had great spurts near the fall when they needed to teased an underwhelming team that, might I add, Brian Cashman said, this team is wonderful. Just give it time. It's going to win a World Series. But how much time do we need? 
And this is where I'll go to this now, because I'm not going to put all the bashing just on Aaron Boone outside of those decisions that he makes fault for. But I'm going to put a lot of pressure now on Brian Cashman. When is enough enough with the New York Yankees? Because when you think about it at this point, Brian Cashman is credited for winning five World Series. But has he really won five World Series? He was handed the keys to those four World Series early on in his GM career. And when has Brian Cashman actually built a baseball team? Think about that 2009 World Series team. Sure, you bought CeCe Sabathia. Sure, you bought Mark Teixeira. Sure, you bought Nick Swisher. Saber Navy didn't work out. He didn't even last nine games. But a lot of players on that team were pieces for years upon years already. You still had the core four. You had Melky Cabrera on that team for three years, along with Robinson Cano. Sure, Brett Gardner was young, along with Java Chamberlain, but you got lucky. And what did that team ever do after 2009? They never came close to a World Series again. So sure, the Yankees made it to Game 7 in the 2017 ALCS. And granted, cheating scandal or not, the Yankees have been on uh, an aspect of regression every single year. But we should trust Brian Cashman's algorithm. Is absolutely okay. And here is my frustration more about Cashman. The fact that he doesn't want to take criticism, the fact that he believes in his own insane world that the Yankees are absolutely perfect. Two trade deadlines in a row. This year, sure, you traded for a sub, a subpar Mendoza line hitter that has a great OPS, the only one in baseball history that could say he's done it more than three times in his career. Sure, you traded for an aging Anthony Rizzo who hasn't batted above a 280 in over three seasons. Granted, injury and so on, and Rizzo came up big for the Yankees in the playoffs. Not saying he didn't again one game, but he was a big part to the Yankees' contributions. But to say that these are future players and impact players, can't. You're telling me this team, when you look at the roster, is no different, just with different names, than the 2015 Yankees that lost to the Astros in a wild card game against what was eventually Cy Young Dallas Keuchel. And my blow at Cashman also is this. I mentioned criticism just a moment ago. The fact that this man, and again, I don't want to take any jumps, but the fact that he deleted his Instagram to turn around and make a private one that only his son and four other people follows proves my point further that he's embarrassed of himself. He's absolutely embarrassed and can't take the criticism from fans, from the organization that is simply frustrated. And, and I just can't stand to watch it. Eddie, when we did the preseason, you know, polls for this year on my expectations, Raheel and I both said, we don't know what's going to happen in the American League. But there's one thing for sure is that we're, we weren't optimistic about the New York Yankees. Yeah, not you, because. You said, not they, because, were, you said they were not going to win the AL East. And you said, I said they were not going to win the AL East. Yes. I, said they, I said they were going to make the postseason, but I did not see this team going to a World Series. And why? I mentioned the Dodgers over and over again. Granted, the Dodgers this year are wild card team, right? But this team already in one wild card game showed immediately why they're a World Series threat. And we're going to see, by the way, the best series, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, of course, but the arguably the best series we'll see in the entirety of the playoffs between the Giants and the Dodgers. And I'm positive of it. However, the Dodgers, again, lack complacency. This is a team that, sure, they believe in their core, but they constantly buy, trade. They're not afraid to develop. Something that Brian Cashman, again, has not done. A lot of his development pieces, sure, we give him a lot of credit for great signings like DJ LeMahieu. But how about all those signings that haven't worked out over the years? I, I can't press it further enough. Yeah, you've won. You've had a winning season every year of your career. That's great. And to put that in fans' faces, that's that's wonderful. Sure, the Yankees are winning. But in this franchise, winning seasons are not enough. We haven't had a World Series win in over 12 years now, once the season is done. And I understand it sounds selfish. For example, Cubs fans waited well over 100 years. But with that being the expectation, with that being set back in 2017, when you fired Joe Girardi for making it seven games in ALCS and losing, how do you not do that to Aaron Boone? Now, granted, Boone's a free agent. And I'm sure the Yankees will entertain offers. But how complacent as a franchise can you continue to be to say, 
I have faith in a GM that hasn't won and hasn't really developed anything on his own. How can I have faith in a manager that continues to make the same mistakes over and over and over again? And for the record, I will say this. This is by no means saying that Aaron Boone is a terrible manager. I think Aaron Boone is a lot better, for example, no pun intended to the Mets fans, but Luis Rojas. And I think that's very evident. However, I will say again that Aaron Boone misses some simplistics. And the big thing is, too, is that he's not a big rally up guy. He's not going to scream in your face whenever because he's held down by management. So when you want to blame Aaron Boone, it goes on Brian Cashman. And Cashman needs to be held accountable. And I honestly really feel he needs to be gone. If he's gone, that's great. But really, the Yankees need a new sense of direction. And listen, what's the, and, uh, this is the last point I'll make. W- who can we blame this year? Stanton had a wonderful season. Outside of the early dry spell, where he, he, early on in April, he didn't hit well. He realistically should have had a near 300 average and absolutely mashed come towards the fall. Aaron Judge had a borderline MVP year if Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Shohei Otani didn't exist. So your two biggest players performed. Yeah, DJ LeMay, who had an off year, and I'll continue not get angry about DJ. DJ played wonderful for the last three seasons. And yes, he got hurt at the end of the year. But I can't get upset at a guy that's been nothing shy of productive and had one off year. The guys I can get frustrated about. Glaber Torres, granted, he has a great postseason average, which means, yeah, sure, he theoretically should come up in the clutch, but he had heavy expectations this year after a terrible, terrible season, and yet again, he didn't live up to it. He made a bunch of errors in the field, did not hit well. Gio Urshela is a great defensive player, arguably made the best defensive play we'll see all season, but is he really a piece of the future? When you're looking for a team that needs more productivity, Aaron Hicks, the man can't stay on the field. And we want to rat on Jacoby Ellsbury. I mean, the proof is in the pudding with the Yankees. We look at it. Clint Frazier, he's not coming back next year. Let's be honest. So the Yankees need a full rebuild aspect. And let's be honest, too. We're probably not getting Anthony Rizzo back. I just don't think Rizzo is going to want to come back to the Yankees. So do what you want with Luke Voigt, but he's always injured, too. The Yankees need a new atmosphere change, and you need to build around your stars you already have. You've locked up LeMahieu. You still have Cole for a couple more years unless he chooses to leave. You have Stan. You have Judge. Build around those guys. Listen, I'm not opposed, and notice I haven't mentioned Brett Gardner yet. I'm not opposed to Gardner still being on the Yankees, but he cannot be an everyday starter. He has to be a fifth option, a fifth option in the outfield. He cannot be an everyday player. This man, might I add, one of the worst postseason hitters I think I've ever seen in baseball. I cannot recall a game, or I should say at least a series, where Brett Gardner's had back-to-back hits in the postseason. So I'll leave it with that. It's got to go on Brian Cashman and no one else. I think that's fair. I just want to make two quick points, then we'll move forward. First, Well, actually, quick. First of all, uh, I don't want to be cliche or anything, but as a Mets fan, I don't want to hear anybody else saying that Garrett Cole is better than Jacob DeGrom. This is twice now in six years that Garrett Cole has completely embarrassed himself on the mound in a wild card game. That's number one. Number two, yeah, Brian Cashman is a problem. Aaron Boone, though, is not helping his cause. I think you guys probably both saw that quote where he said that the gap has closed between us and the rest of the league. That's not true. The gap closed years ago. They are not the same Yankees dynasty of the mid 2000s. And I'll close with this. The Yankees keep thinking they have this great farm system, that the baby bomber era is still here. Well, guess what? Aaron Judge is going to start his eighth MLB season next year. He's been around for a long time. Same with Gary Sanchez. They're not new players anymore. You got to compliment them with some talented veteran players that you can trust. And there definitely has to be some changes in the front office with a manager and on the field. But let's transition here to the Dodgers and Giants, who, by the way, this is the first time... I'm shocked they've ever met before in the playoffs in the history of Major League Baseball. These two big rivals, both with 105 plus wins, historic years for both teams. Dodgers, as expected, they beat the Cardinals. Cardinals had that 17 game winning streak, but the Dodgers took care of business. Giants somehow kept things going, even though everybody doubted them this year. So Haley heading into this Dodgers Giants series, two talented teams. What are you looking for and who do you think comes out on top? Okay, honestly, it's it's so hard to even think about it because these are such great teams. I mean, this is the most watched series, honestly. It's just a great 
two great teams. I see, I really want the Giants to win. And I'm going to tell you this. The Dodgers make it to the World Series. It's so boring. Am I the only one that thinks that? That's incredibly boring. Like, I want to see something new. The Dodgers have an all-star lineup. Like, we can't we can't run away from that. I mean, their team is stacked. They're loaded. They're pitching. They're all, like, everything. They, they have everything to win it. But the Giants are also a great team. And I think what's so cool is I love watching the Giants play. They're such a fun team to watch, especially because you can't name – you can name like almost everyone off that Dodgers lineup. The Giants, not so much. I mean, you have a couple all-stars on that team, but most of them, you really don't even know their names. And I think that's the beauty in it all. So I do want, I do want the Giants to win and I see them winning. And I see this series going to game five. I mean, this is just a great series, but the Dodgers are, I mean, they're neck and neck. This is such, this is so hard to tell just because of how much talent both of these teams have. Yeah, and Tim said it. I think this is going to be the most competitive of the four series. I also yeah. seeing this going five games, but the difference for me right now is the Dodgers pitching, which has so much experience in the postseason with Walker Bueller, of course, Max Scherzer, who looked pretty good in that wild card game against the Cardinals and has been downright historic since he joined the Dodgers at the trade deadline. I think the Giants have some talent, but you guys like Scott Kazmier, Logan Webb, you have some people that are new to this pitching in the postseason. And like Haley mentioned, some, un, you know, unknown guys. Now, the Tampa Bay Rays have been in a similar boat before and made it to the World Definitely. Series. Definitely. Yeah, but I think the Dodgers will have the edge and this will go to a fifth game. Tim, over to you on this series. Yeah, I think this is going to go five games, but I'm not going to bet against the Dodgers. I Listen, I know they're a wild card team and, and they've been digging and I know it makes a boring story granted the giants have really developed and they've done a good job no one expected them to hold on but you get max scherzer game five maybe against kevin galsman whoever whoever the pitcher is for san francisco that they'll go with i've got my money on that max i mean this man is competitive he's done nothing but be successful and the fact of the matter is too let's put it like this uh i actually don't know who start or Who's starting game one in that series? Is it going to be Kershaw or is it Bueller? I think it's Bueller. For, yeah. It's going to be Bueller. Because I'm, saying, elbow injury. Cause I'm saying, oh, yeah, that's right, too. Because I was going to say, too, the way you can the, – the Dodgers historically have done it, too, in a five-game series or even in the World Series, they're not going to be scared to throw another starter in relief if it means shutting down an offense. And I think, again, this is where, theoretically, experience always – tends to be youth we watched that happen to the Braves you know and in, in that whole cycle same thing as well uh, with the Yankees as well back in 2017 granted that's a few years ago but we tend to see this picture time and time again and we also for the record too we saw the Brewers um but to, to say that this game is going to go five series and then you have Max Scherzer out in the mound and the Dodgers don't win I, I just it's hard for me to believe. I think LA still is a good team. You got to get them in a series. And again, this is going to be the series to watch, but I don't want to discredit San Francisco at all. This is a team that was developing for seasons now, finally has come back into relevancy. You made some important trades. For example, you got a guy like Chris Bryant, who, you know, he is an absolute superstar and still a great hitter. And you, you look, too, they got some death pieces. They, they got, what, Tyler Estrada and Mike Talkman as well from the Yankees, and they turned out to be really, really good death pieces as well. But at the same time, with that and that youth comes inexperience. Guys like Yastrzemski, they're going to have to learn how to hit in these moments and come up big in the pitching staff as well. So I, I would say, again, San Francisco is going to be a real good team for not just next year but a few years to come. But I think the Dodgers are still the team that's setting the expectations. And we have to remember this, too. The Dodgers still, as scary as this sounds, are not a full unit. What happens, for example, that rotation next year, if Trevor Bauer is to ever come back and clears everything up in his name? That team now has Walker Buehler, Clayton Kershaw, Max Scherzer, Trevor Bauer. Those are four guys that are borderline top of the rotation pitchers, you know, uh, uh, spider tack or not those guys are still borderline top of the rotation pitchers. And you also have Urias, who been promising. He can work in and out of the pen as well. And I just look at that for that Dodgers rotation. It's a gift that never stops giving. There's always an if, an addition, and continued progress. And I think for the Dodgers, that progress is only going to continue 
does it mean they won a World Series? I don't know. But the Dodgers are definitely going to be a team to watch, in my opinion. So let's shift to the other NL series. Actually, 10 minutes ago, the Brewers defeated the Braves in game one, two to one. I think this is going to be another close series. Milwaukee has had a surprisingly good year. A lot of people thought they'd take a step back, but their pitching led by Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff has been really good. The Braves kind of somehow survived that NL East despite losing their best pitcher, Mike Soroka, again to a second torn Achilles, losing Ronald Acuna Jr. And they've still survived, but I think the Brewers have the upper hand in this series. I think I, I, overall, the Brewers have been a better team than anybody from the NL East. The Braves are coming from the worst division in the major leagues. I mean, I'm a Mets fan and I'll admit that, but I think the Brewers get this series maybe in four games or so. They, they started off good with the game one victory. Haley, how about you? Yeah, I mean, there's not much to really say about this series, I don't think. I, I agree with you completely. I mean, I, I do think the Brewers are going to take it. I think their pitching is really going to help them take that. And I don't, I, I mean, I see this being like a one and done. I, I don't see the Braves advancing at all. Yeah, the Braves, it's just, I think if they were fully healthy. Oh, definitely. Yeah, if they had Acuna, I think this lineup would look completely different. Just having that spark plug and that leader, but they're leaving Freddie Freeman really having to do a lot himself. And that's really stalling out the offense as we saw only one run in game one. Tim, how about you on this Braves Brewers series? We would have to agree. I think the Brewers dominate this series. Listen, you know, for Atlanta, he, he, while the year in the beginning looked promising, you won the NL least, as I like to call it. None of those teams were competitive this year and give Atlanta credit. They battled through injuries and so on to find a way to, you know, win the division and make it this far. But with those injuries, with the lack of depth, the Brewers, I mean, they have a dominant pitching rotation up there with L.A. and, and San Francisco. So uh, I think it's one in four games. I think uh, the Brewers lose game three, but they'll come home game four and ultimately victorious in the series. Let's shift gears to the American League now. Uh, well, one series is nearly wrapped up already through two days. The Astros and the White Sox, Houston with a 2-0 lead. I was seeing some pretty crazy stats in that uh, group chat where in Tim three wins in the playoffs for the AL Central since 2017. They have not had really any sort of deep run in the playoffs since 2016. That was with the Indians, and they blew a 3-1 lead in the World Series. And before that, it was when the Royals won the World Series in a year that was, let's be honest, a down year throughout the major leagues. I mean, my Mets somehow made it to the World Series, and the American League East and West were struggling really as well that year. But the White Sox, again, so much promise, such a talented roster, and just getting completely murdered by the Houston Astros offense. Craig Kimbrell, so many fans are saying how they lost that trade. Craig Kimbrell had been unbelievable with the Cubs when they acquired him at the deadline for Nick Madrigal, one of the Cubs, one of the White Sox top prospects at that time. And Craig Kimbrell has just been awful. And once again, got knocked around today against Houston. Astros on the brink of eliminating the White Sox. The Astros pitching staff has been really good. Haley, do you think Houston closes out this series? Definitely. This is my favorite series, by the way. I love this series. I have to say, though, I did not expect the White Sox to fold the way they did. I mean, we were just talking about earlier how a lot of these teams like Tampa Bay, the Giants, they have some people on their team that are you really don't know them. But I mean, both of these teams, you know their lineup, you know their starting rotation, you know who's in their bullpen. I mean, they just have so much talent. I love this series so much. Oh my gosh. But yeah, Houston's taking it for sure. If you would have asked me this before the series would have started, I would have said this is probably another series that might be going to game five, but the way it's playing out right now, Houston definitely has it. Now, Tim, I assume you're in the same boat that Houston's going to close this out, but what specifically is wrong with the White Sox? Because This is two years in a row where they've showed so much promise. They've been hyped up as one of the top teams in the American league and just completely collapsed when the postseason starts. Well, I think, yeah, a lot of it has to do with Chicago. The fact that, yeah, while granted they are building, we have to remember this team faced a lot of injuries this season as well. Sure, they traded for Kimbrell, but might I also add this, where Kimbrell is continuously falling apart is not against terrible teams, which might I add in the AL Central, when you face teams like the Royals, the Indians, you know, a little bit mediocre here and there, and the Minnesota Twins, yeah, you're going to get a lot of good opportunities to dominate bad baseball teams. But, for example, the Yankees dominated Craig Kimball, a team that offensively stank, especially in the last three innings of the game. 
they came up, they come up big in that middle series right after they traded for Kimbrel and get a couple of big hits. And it wasn't just the Yankees. Uh, I forget which team had played in that two, three series after. Maybe it was the A's. Forget maybe maybe it was the A's, but as well, a late victory off of Craig Kimbrel. And the fact of the matter is this is you know, when you look at the trends, look back at Kimball's statistics, just can't get it done right now against good baseball teams that are competing in the postseason. And it's unfortunate because Craig Kimbrough got a really good pitcher at one of the, at one time in his career was arguably the best, if not one of the best closers in all baseball back when he was with Atlanta. But it's just unfortunate. He's not still together. Last year, he struggled a bit after coming back midseason. Now, ERA wise and statistically, again, he's really solid and sound. But in a, as a postseason pitcher, for example, like Clayton Kershaw, it just has not panned out for him in big moments. And again, I'll, I'll say this for, um, for Chicago. Injuries. Injuries have completely killed this team. It, it's just a fact of the matter. You've had to overcome so much. And if, if you're a White Sox fan watching, still have faith. Really, still have faith in this team. Because I truthfully believe this team is still going to be good moving forward with or without Craig Kimball. Grant, I think they gave him an extension in the middle of the year, if I'm not wrong. So I think he's going to be there for a little bit. But needless to say, just when you look at this roster, it has still a lot of promise. Sure, you traded Magical away, but it's really that outfield that needed a lot of help. And this offseason as well could add to that depth for this team. So, yeah, while right now, again, it's not Chicago's time to shine. Uh, I think that this team does has, still have a lot of promise. And I think that next year you could see a little bit more of a playoff push from this team. Yeah, I think the roster is solid. I think there's a couple more additions you have to make. Specifically, I think the starting rotation, you could use another arm. You can't be banking on 35-year-old Lance Lynn to lead you into the playoffs. And despite how strong Tim Anderson can be in the flashy moments with the bat, he can also play third base. He can also DH. Maybe try if you want to spend. We know the White Sox do have some money they can spend. They're one of the more wealthy teams in the league, not all the way at the top, but they have the potential. Those shortstops out there, so many on the market, maybe not one of the top guys like Correa, but maybe someone like Marcus Simeon or something like that who could be a big impact player defensively and on the offensive side. I think there's some potential for the White Sox. But last series I want to get to here, the Red Sox and the Rays. Of course, like we said, Boston won the wild card game. Tampa Bay, though, right now is on top five to two in game one. And Chris Sale got knocked out of the game in the first inning, gave up a grand slam to Jordan Luplo. So the Rays are playing well. Now, the Rays just continue to confuse me because this team has players, and I know Haley's going to agree with me here. You've never heard of them before. They just keep replenishing them, typically with castaways from other teams who never really had success, then find themselves with the Rays. Then you complement that with some huge prospects like Wander Franco, who's entered the league and has been an absolute stud at shortstop. And their pitching rotation, they let Blake Snell walk. Blake Snell was the ace of their staff that got them to the World Series last year. They do not have a single starting pitcher returning from their World Series team, yet they're still the favorites in the American League. I don't know how they do this. And right now they're in front in game one. Haley, maybe you could explain it a little better than I can, but what do you see from the Rays and if they can close this out against Boston in this series? Eddie, I don't know how to explain it either. This is a confusing team. I mean, it's, I see them taking it. I really do. They're such a great team. They're very consistent. Um, I see them taking it over Boston, but this is, I mean, not to go back to my Yankees. I, I, mean, I am a Yankee fan, okay, but I know, like, even if we did advance, I knew we were never going to make it past Tampa Bay. That, that, that team scares me, but this is just a team that you never take lightly. I mean, they have what it's, I mean, they have everything. They're loaded. They're stacked. I definitely see them taking this series. And the depth is crazy too. Brett Phillips, for example, who had that huge hit last year to bring home Randy Arozarena, win the World Series game against the Dodgers. One of the biggest hits in recent memory in the World Series. Didn't even make the cut to make their division series roster. It just shows the talent that they have top to bottom on that team. And Definitely ups them fill in. They had a lot of injuries this year, but they had a lot of depth that was able to fill in key pieces. That's why they still won 100 games. So, Tim, lastly here on baseball, do you think the Rays are going to close this out and win the series? 
I think they're going to come out strong and they're going to close out the series. Again, we have to remember this for Boston. Eovaldi went in the wild card game and now we'll see what happens when he pitches maybe game three for Boston. But we have to remember too, Chris Sale, give him a lot of credit. He's bounced back, at least not, not in the game one, but this season overall, he's bounced back coming back from injury. Let's be honest. And I think Red Sox fans ultimately too kind of forgot Chris Sale existed for a little bit. Just like how kind of how Mets fans until towards the end of the season briefly forgot Noah Syndergaard existed. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, Chris Sale, I still think shown a lot of potential. But for Boston, I mean, I, I, I don't know because Boston, I feel like it's steel game or two. If I'm being honest, and it's all about the matchups. And big thing too, media wise today came out for Tampa Bay is the fact that their owner, after winning Game One of the ALD or excuse me the LDS, turns around and says, "We can't stay in Tampa Bay." We need to go. We need to sell the team from, or at least move the team, sell our spot in the trough, and move elsewhere. It's just no longer substantial. So I'm eager to see how the team receives that moving forward because this could be the last season. Well, maybe next year, but this still could be theoretically the last season. We could see Tampa Bay at, at the trough. And may, may that stadium, if that's the case, rest in peace because I'm going to be honest, one of the worst stadiums, one of the worst locations in all of baseball, and it's very, very evident. But this team is showing a lot of promise, showing why they're a World Series favorite. I still don't know if I could say the Rays won the World Series this year, if I'm being honest. But, man, is this team so so compelling, so interesting to watch. Because there's just so many names that you may not know. Granted, Rosarena should be a very familiar name based upon last year now. And by the way, didn't he steal home yesterday? Uh, yes, if he did. He stole home? Yes. So it's not surprising that that aspect is not surprising him being aggressive, hitting great, whatever, but man, they, it, this team is just so compelling and interesting to watch. And it, they just, the bullpen too, the bullpen gets better and better and better. The rotation obviously stepped up, but I think that's the most underrated part of this race team. They have such an elite bullpen. It doesn't matter who you throw there. I mean, they, David Robertson, David Robertson is in the bullpen of that team coming back from injuries upon injuries. No one thought he was going to be relevant. He had opportunity signs with so many teams after his stint in Philadelphia and he came to the Rays, and he's been consistent too for the Rays. Granted small sample size, but it's just another sample. The Rays can make anyone decent through good coaching and good, you know, a, a good understanding of what it takes to win a baseball game. And they've got good good vision too, just to see scope out these players. David Robertson was playing in the Olympics two months ago and wasn't really didn't really have a major league career necessarily on his mind. I mean, he's approaching forty years old. It's been a long time since he was dominating with the Yankees out of the bullpen back in the late two thousands. But should be fun to see as we continue through October. Haley Galindo, thanks so much for joining us today on Sports Big. Thank you for having me. It was a blast. So let's move on now as Tim and I will be joined by Drew Jewa to break down some NASCAR action from Talladega. Continuing here on Sportspeak, hope everybody's enjoying so far. I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. Tim, remember to say his name now. Uh, we're joined now by Drew Jewa. Great to have him on to talk some NASCAR action. Crazy weekend at Talladega and the Roval coming up with some rain in the forecast. Drew, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Eddie. So let's get started. Let's jump in first with the cup race, of course. And before we get into the actual racing, I mean, you got to mention Bubba Wallace picking up his first career win. Of course, there's some critics about him winning a rain race, but then again, so many people have done that before. And I, I have to compare it to the Justin Haley win because at least Bubba Wallace raced his way to the front and everybody was racing hard those last few laps because they knew the rain was imminent. Whereas with Justin Haley got lucky because of a big one and then people pitting Kurt Busch should have really won that race if they had, you know, uh, called the red flag properly, not in the middle of a caution sequence after pit road had already opened. But uh, Drew, first, Bubba Wallace getting the win. But of course, your uh, your impressions from the race on Sunday, uh, Monday, Monday. Forgot about the race. Yeah, <laughs> it was a crazy race. Um, they all knew that the rain was coming, and Bubba Wallace made the right moves, and he ended up getting to the front right when he needed to. Uh, there were other people around him that, I mean, there was that wreck with, uh, who else? Ryan Priest. Mm -hmm. Then who else was in that wreck? Bubble, uh, Byron. Oh, and Byron. Who came yeah, up they all, for me, but I <laughs> yeah, they all, they all, they all had the same, uh, 
idea, and Bubba Wallace was just in the right place at the right time. Caution helped him too, though. So, Tim, I want to turn it, of course, because there were some wrecks. But something I noticed, and I know everything's going to be thrown out the window next year with the next-gen car, but Daytona had really five big ones between the two races. There was not a necessarily a big one in either of the two Talladega Cup races. Do you think that's credit more to the package or a bit more discipline from the drivers themselves? I think a mix of it has to do with discipline, but I definitely think the package has a little bit more to do with it as well, with the slower speeds, at least from what we've seen now through Daytona as well as this Talladega race, because at least my understanding, they brought the same package from last track. So, you know, to me, that's the beauty. Now, I will say the one upsetting thing that I've seen time and time again, but I add to, I've seen it on iRacing a lot, and Drew can tell you too, pushing the pusher. We still cannot do that yet. We watched Michael McDowell win the Daytona 500 that way when Keselowski and Logano tangled up. Uh, I believe it was Logano got pushed into Brad, and they, they went all piling through, and McDowell goes on by. We saw it happen to Ryan Newman the year before in the Daytona 500, and we saw it this week with Alex Bowman. Uh, literally, might I add, anyone I watch is radioactive. Best sequence I've ever heard in radioactive by Kevin Hamlin. Dri- drivers with you and we're in the blanking wall <laughs> that's it's so casually so casually but it was another example another thing too this year's daytona 500 i know a lot of daytona references but we've seen it down there here and there as well but data or daytona this year uh, obviously I mentioned that 500 remember the big wreck that started from an incident of Almirola getting pushed by the pusher and three people pushing together caused havoc. It doesn't matter what package it is, unfortunately. There's be Rex. But I would say this where the package has done a good job is that it's lower down the speeds, allowed guys to slow down more, miss more Rex, which is a good thing. But at the same time, I'm still, and honestly, one thing that concerns me about the package, and we'll see what happens with next gen. But the big thing that still just bothers me about this package, we saw this happen at much higher speeds with Carl Edwards, don't get me wrong. But I just don't like the idea that cars can lock together, really separate, and then have the opportunity to get turned. And that's what caused Newman's accident. That's what caused Carl Edwards' accident. Uh, and I know those are two instances rare, but knowing NASCAR, it can be more than possible to happen again. So that's the only concern I have. Granted, we haven't seen anyone flip yet, but I'm very positive with the idea of tandeming uh, for a lap or two, especially on the final lap. It very likely we will see it happen again before NASCAR changes everything up another time. Yeah, but generally I think this package, at least this year, it seemed a little bit safer in terms of the Cup Series especially. We saw the one upside-down crash for Joey Logano. Nothing too severe aside from that. But Tim, of course, you're a Bowman fan. you got to be frustrated because it almost seemed sort of a mirror image to the Daytona 500 when he got turned when he was right up near the front on the outside line. But talking about the playoff cutoff, of course, and Hendrick is not looking particularly good right now. Chase Elliott is slightly above the cut line. Bowman and Byron both below. Drew, I'll start with you. Do you think there's a chance we get multiple Hendrick drivers missing out on the round of eight? Drew, mute, unmute. Drew, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure, though. Uh, both uh, Bowman and Be- – I'm sorry, not Bell. Bo- Bowman and Byron are both right in, in like, must-win situations. Uh, Elliot only about, like, 20, 12 points, something like that above the cutoff uh if he doesn't have a good day and he like goes into the tums harper turn again he's definitely he's definitely going to be uh having that chance again out in the round of eight uh very big upset uh but people like byron and bowman both are in must win new situations so it's gonna be very interesting to see how many how how hendrick limits the damage so i i think both Byron and Bowman will both get out if, you know, so. Yeah. I, mean, I apologize there, by the way. The bug passed by my ear. That's why I was looking <laughs> at the I just did add one thing to Drew's point. And by, by the way, while we're still in a Talladega, not just the future, but one thing to add too, both of the Hendrick uh, drivers' dem- uh, demise at Talladega, granted and Byron's was not created by a Hendrick driver, but Kyle Larson was wrecked as a result of William Byron. 
Alex Bowman, yeah, it was off the bumper of Ricky Stenhouse Jr., but it was created from an overaggressive push by Chase Elliott. So realistically, at Talladega, another story might have had, because it happened earlier in the year. Remember when Denny Hamlin and Truex had that pileup and it was Hendrick cars wiping out each other? Talladega, again, was Hendrick cars wiping out each other, which continues to be the reason why I truthfully believe that we will not see, obviously, Bowman had one second place performance. Uh, I think it was two years ago at the Roval. I don't will ever see him come close to a, a top two at a road course ever again in his career. But Byron, in my opinion, has a legitimate chance. I just don't think, though, they could beat uh, Chase Elliott or Kyle Larson. I think Elliott and Larson will be safe. Yeah, I mean, I really think it boils down to four drivers that have a legitimate chance at winning. Uh, actually, five. One is A.J. Allmendinger. I'm just going to throw in there because you never know with him. But four playoff drivers, I think they'd have a serious chance at winning the race. One is Chase Elliott, of course. He's the king of the road courses. Kyle Larson's really been neck and neck with him all season. Denny Hamlin showed a lot of speed at the road courses. Of course, the Indy road course nearly got that win. And then Martin Truex Jr., who I saw actually one of his spotters this weekend, is Cole Pern, who's actually back with the team for the weekend, which should be very interesting to see. Drew, some picks for the Roval. Who do you think is going to end up below the cut line? And who do you think is going to end up winning the race? Uh, I think the winner of the race, it's going to be a long shot as he was, he won the first, uh, the inaugural, inaugural uh, Roval race. I think Ryan Blaney somehow out of nowhere getting, <laughs> getting all lucky again, he will win at the Roval and uh, lock his way into the round of eight. I think he's like already pretty secure there, but uh, I think, uh, Bell, Bowman, Byron, they're all gonna, they're all gonna not win the race. So I think those are the three. And then since I still think he's washed, I think Kevin Harvick will miss out on the round of eight. That That's my four drivers. It's, it's going to be a interesting race. It's going to be about missing all the, uh, the turns, you know? So I, I think those are the four that miss and Ryan Blaney wins at the Roval. I forgot to give my four that I think are going to miss. So I agree. Byron Bowman Bell, those three are out of it, really need to win to get in. But for that final spot, Kevin Harvick's actually done pretty decent at the road courses this year, aside from the Daytona road course at the beginning of the year where he was a mess, especially in the clash. He kept spinning out. But I think, first of all, I think it's going to be Brad Kislowski. This fight happened. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. I'm I sorry. Just, Go ahead. I just have that feeling with Kislowski. I know we've both been very hard on Kislowski at times, and I actually projected Kislowski to have a little bit of a surprise run into the playoffs, and he started off well. But when you look at what's happened to him at road courses, especially over the last few years, first of all, I don't know what's happened because in the early 20 teens, he used to be dominant. He used to be one of the contenders at Watkins Glen year in and year out with Marcus Ambrose. Same at Sonoma. And really since about 2015, his road course skills have just completely gone away. And it's not like Penske is doing bad because Logano and Blaney have been consistent at the road courses, even with neither of them really being the best road course driver out there. So I have a feeling something could happen to Brad Kislowski, some sort of wreck going into the Tums heartburn turn. We know somebody's going to slam into that. Depends how much damage. Cause we also know Chase Elliott ran into that and still managed to win a race, but Helped him. I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I think Kislowski is going to miss. And one person I'd watch out for, I don't think Kyle Busch is going to win, and we've seen him have mistakes in stupid situations. In the rain, you never know about that 18. But, Tim, who's your pick to win at the Roval, and who do you think is going to miss out? Well, I'll start with my four out. I agree 100% with you, Eddie. I think that's going to be my four as well. Listen, I'll start with this. Penske has had such a quiet playoff outside of Ryan Blaney that you just know at this point something is going to have to go wrong for either Brad Keselowski or Joey Logano. Let's be honest, Keselowski this entire year was mediocre. And the fact of the matter is this, that literally, might I have the last two road course races of the season, our highlight of Brad Keselowski is him wrecking his own teammate of Joey Logano. Uh, twice, I think, at Watkins Glen, he wrecked Logano. And then, uh, was it Coda, maybe? The, the track before? No. Well, what was it, maybe Road America? Whichever track it was, though, before that, 
needless to say, they also collected each other again, but it came on the end of Brad Keselowski. So the fact of the matter is this. I think that is just out of the the road course in this package, and I genuinely think this is his time to fall apart. If it's not him, then I'm going to be honest, I think it's Joey Logano, but we're going to see a Penske car, in my opinion, go in this round, and it's, I mean, Bowman Byron, they're gone. Bell, I don't want to necessarily count up Bell because of Daytona, but I truthfully think it was out as well. Um, I don't think he really has a chance to win, but uh, listen, I can't shy away. I know Kyle Larson has been great, but my God, Chase Elliott is so good at this place. And I know I say this every time we go to a road course, but considering the the minor, minor struggles, might I add, Chase has had now through this playoffs, he hasn't had the runs he, he's wanted. A win at the Roval can change the whole complexion for him in the playoffs. And might I add, too, gives him bonus points going to the next round, something that Denny Hamlin, give him credit, has done a very good job at adding this playoff. For Chase, he needs to win this race to really help himself to be a contender, to uh, have a chance at a Final Four. I still don't think, for the record, he's going to make the Final Four, but a win this weekend can solidify and give him at least an opportunity to, to really come up over the next three races to make the championship. Should be really interesting at the Roval, especially if rain is in the forecast to see, first of all, how NASCAR handles it, because last time we had to deal with rain, it was in New Hampshire, and they tried them out in the Oval with rain, and everybody spun. Coda was nearly a dangerous situation in the rain, so we'll see how much they push the limits, especially with last year with the Xfinity Roval race, turning into a complete chaotic event with all the rain throughout that one, but should be interesting to watch the action this weekend. One more thing with Drew before we let him go. Atlanta Braves lost today. I mean, God, uh, they're down 1-0. We talked about this already with Haley. But do you think the Braves have a chance to win this series? What's going on with them? Uh, I, I hope we do. Uh, these injuries have uh, helped and hurt us. We, got, we gained some from the Acuna injury with uh, Jock Peterson. Uh, but – we just been too inconsistent all season. We can win a few games and then the next few games we're struggling to put up runs. So I'm hoping that we can bring it back against the Brewers, but uh, I'm just glad we made it to the playoffs though. Yeah. I mean, uh, my Mets kind of let you have that because of how they just fell apart in the last two months, but uh, baseball playoffs should be fun. So is NASCAR action. Uh, Drew Jua. Thank you so much for joining us here on sports week. Hope to have you back again next time. Thank you. All right, so that'll just about wrap up today's episode. Next week, we'll have a panel for an NBA season preview. You won't want to miss that. But until next time, I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. Signing off here on Sportspeak. We hope you have a great rest of your weekend.